What's up, everybody? I am here again. You're the, Brother Richard, you're the first person that is back before Randy Harris or Mike Cope or any of those other, you know, people that are known and loved. You are back because you write like so quick. You were here last time during COVID because of your book on Johnny Cash, the gospel according to Johnny Cash, which I didn't tell you this, got a huge, people loved that video. They love Johnny Cash and, and your, your take on um, Jesus walking the line for Johnny Cash with Abraham. That's killer, man. That was so great. And now you've written another book. Yeah. COVID helps you and gives you some time to write, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, you you are a pretty prolific writer. Um, I I read this book. It comes out in March. Um, Brother Richard is an elder at the church that I used to work at and a, a very dear friend. Like, I love you and Jana and your boys. Um, but we've also had so many lunches and conversations talking about what this book is about because we both have kind of a a burden on us the book is called hunting magic ills uh you want to explain that for a second yeah the subtitle is more descriptive and so it's called recovering an enchanted faith in a skeptical age yeah and the, the hunting magic eels is wasn't my title the publisher kind of has the authority to pick the title but i begin the book with the, with the story being in wales with my with my wife and we were visiting this celtic island where there was this celtic saint who had an abbey in this in this well that had these enchanted eels in it and so when lovers came to the well they could throw in like a handkerchief into the well and the legend had it if the eels disturbed the handkerchief that would be a sign that your lover would be faithful forever uh, and she became like the saint valentine's um, of the welsh and, and I talk about, I use that story of these magic eels to talk about how, to illustrate how sociologists have described how 500 years ago the world was enchanted, where it was full of supernatural powers. God existed, the devil was real, miracles happened, um, and how we've made this 500-year journey into this skeptical age, the, uh, an age of disenchantment, sociologists call it, where you have increasing rates of agnosticism, atheism, the rise of the nuns, young people who don't affiliate with any religious belief. And so it's just a playful title to kind of illustrate what does it mean to kind of recover our sense of wonder, enchantment, belief in an increasingly post-Christian culture and world. Which is something that you and I have talked about a lot. Um, I, I, I love the book. I, I just showed you, I printed off a copy of it. This is how much, it's way less daunting than it looks on this giant. Uh, it, it's very accessible and I know it doesn't come out for a few more months, but the reason I wanted you to talk to PV people tonight, and I hope other people, uh, share and watch this as well, because our kids and our grandkids and um, you know, for some people watching ourselves, uh, we live in a world where faith, has, it seems like faith in Jesus has become more and more difficult or more and more heavy to bear. And you, so the book, which is never far from hand, A Secular Age, which I think you, and Tim Keller are the ones that I learned about this book from. You're telling that story, that big old 800-page book story, in a really accessible form. Do you mind, like, giving, like, the elevator pitch for that book? Or, like, some of mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think one of the things Taylor does in that very – it's a kind of a cultural history about, about that 500-year journey. Um, and, and, the, and the reasons why that, that it happened. And, um, and so I kind of tell a little bit of that story about why it happened, um, about, for example, how we, so like, for example, the rise of uh, science. A lot of people think that the reason why the world became more secular is because we became more scientific. 
And, and one of the things I talk about in the book is that not, not necessarily um, uh, an, an increasingly sophisticated factual description of the world doesn't present any real religious problem. But one of the things science did do is it changed how we imagined or experienced the world. And so we began to uh, see the world like a machine or a clock. And so there's that famous watchmaker argument that, that the design of the cosmos is evidence of an intelligent designer. And we've used that argument for a long time within Christianity to kind of, you know, as an argument for the existence of God. But one of the ironies of that argument is how it disenchants us because once the watch is, is wound, it runs on its own and, and God, God becomes distant, right? It, it, the, the world runs because of the laws of physics that he established. And so God just gets one step removed from our day-to-day -day life. He's up there kind of watching and supervising the watch, but not intimately involved in it. And so our imaginations change. Like in Dante, the final lines of the Divine Comedy, he stands up looking at the, the movement of the spheres. And, he's, and he says, he beholds the love that moves the sun and the other stars. So that was the way 500 years ago we saw the cosmos. When we looked at the sky, we saw a providential love moving the stars. But now, as, as moderns, even as believers, we look at the sky and we just see the laws of physics. We see a, a mechanism. And mm -hmm. so that, that's a profound difference in the way we not just imagine the world, but experience the world. Um, the world is now more dead to us because yep. it's a machine. And so it lacks an ability to surprise us during the day versus a more enchanted way of viewing the world, which is, um, and this is something you, you've uh, drawn my attention to, is the way G.K. Chesterton talks about the, 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 surpri the surprise of creation. Recovery, yeah. How like wonder, we've, lo we've lost that capacity. So that's just one example of kind of some of the things that have changed in the way we've imagined the world, uh, where we've lost a little bit of our surprise and awe and wonder at creation. And that's just one and part of the story. The whole time you were talking, I was thinking of that Chesterton quote where, you know, the whole modern uh, enterprise is built on a faulty assumption that because things keep on repeating, it must be lifeless. But what yeah. if God says every morning to the sun, do it again? Mm -hmm. um, so you in your in the book you borrow I think from Andrew Root where you do uh, the the gorilla the invisible gorilla experiment mm -hmm. and one of the things I love about getting your book before it's published is I totally ripped that off a month ago in a sermon because I thought that is genius it it because the what you call the passes between team science and team technology changed where we put our attention. And then you you use the story of Moses and the Exodus to kind of reframe what we need to do in a disenchanted age. You mind talking about that for a second? Yeah, Andrew Root in his book, A Pastor in a Secular Age, uses this experiment from the psychologist Daniel Simons on what's called attention or observation blindness. And I think a lot of your people probably have seen that famous YouTube clip which was an actual psychological experiment where Simons made people watch two basketball teams pass a basketball back and forth, counting the number of passes. And so you do that on the video and then the video stops and says, you know, how many passes did you count? You say 16 and they go, great, but did you see the dancing gorilla? And most people did not see a dancing gorilla. So the video rewinds and lo and behold, in the middle of this, passing teams you see some a dancing gorilla in the middle of the of the uh the teams and so and so that's an example of what psychologists call attention blindness that your attention helps you see things count the number of passes but in helping you see blinds you to very obvious parts of reality even the most obvious point of reality like the most obvious thing about that video clip the strangest thing is the gorilla and yet it's the very thing that you're blinded to wow. and so Root's, Root's argument is is that we tend to think that the decline of Christianity in the West has been a journey from belief to disbelief and so our problem is disbelief doubt 
a skepticism. And Root says that's not the problem. The problem has been one of attentional shift. Mm -hmm. That disbelief is being driven by attentional issues, um, this attentional blindness. So God never went anywhere. Going back to the miracle of creation that you were talking about, G.K. Chesterton. So the fundamental miracle remains central. But our attention has been directed elsewhere, and we can't see the obvious thing in front of us. Um, And so I use this story of Moses in the burning bush because he's on Mount Horeb in the middle of nowhere, and he sees to the side this strange sight. And Moses says to himself, I must turn aside to see the strange sight. So I kind of use that as a biblical metaphor that the strange sights are still there. The the fundamental miracle, the presence of God is still there. But Moses says, I must turn aside to see it. So there is this attentional shift that has to occur for us to see the wonder again and recover the wonder. So the book is about, first of all, how our attention has been shifted. And we've talked about that like with science. But then it's also about this, how can we, retrain ourselves to see that very obvious sacred thing right in front of us. Yeah. I I love that so much. One of the things that is interesting to me about the Bible is that when it talks about idolatry, the principal symptom of idolatry is that you have ears to hear, but cannot hear and eyes to see, but cannot see. And so idolatry is connected to attention uh, or the inability to have attention. Um, yeah, or, or I would add their perception. That's, that's the other idea, that the kingdom of God um, is fundamentally about a perceptual issue. So Jesus says, you know, the one who has he- ears, right? So everybody can hear the same message, but only some people actually really hear it. Mm. Uh, and, and vision as well. So again, instead of instead of thinking about belief as a matter of like cognitive agreement, or, or as I describe it to my students, Christianity isn't fundamentally about forcing yourself to believe in unbelievable things. Um, you just get, like, like belief is this horse pill you have to swallow. You just gotta swallow it. Even if it doesn't make any sense to you, you gotta just believe it. And a lot of people, especially young people, find that just hard. How can I make myself believe something I don't believe in? I can't force myself to believe. But if faith is a matter of attention and perception, that is something we can change. We can yeah. focus our eyes on the different aspects of reality. And with those attentional changes, um, we, we create different plausibility structures for faith. Faith becomes more believable to us because of the way we're attending to the world differently. And you, in, in your book, and I guess I knew you at kind of the back end of your own uh, walk with your doubt your years of doubt because you know I, I heard you describe it when i was at highland but it was more of you were already um reconstructing what you what you believed but you you walk through how this happened in your own life do you mind sharing a little bit of that yeah so so early in my writing i, I started a blog you know um, back in the early days of blogging when that was actually a thing. Uh, <laughs> and and I was doing a lot of what we call deconstruction. And so for, for those of your church that don't know that phrase, it's kind of a phrase out there in the Christian uh, conversational space about a season of kind of like asking really hard questions and to kind of tear down your faith into its component parts to see what survives this intense scrutiny. Um, and, and, and one of the products of deconstruction, and this is what happened in my own life, so when I was going through this process, is, you, is it seems like the reigning advice um, among a lot of kind of modern Christians is if you can believe less and less, mm. then, then faith becomes easier to carry, right? So faith is heavy right? Forcing yourself to believe in these unbelievable things. Then what we can do is believe less of it or also believe less strongly in it. And so faith becomes a lighter burden because you don't have to believe in all of this stuff, but you know, but there's a a few things that you don't want to let go, you know? And um, so for example, I wrote that book about the devil years ago that we could talk about. 
And so like, that's one of the things a lot of like modern skeptical Christians have trouble believing in, right? You know, if, if believing in God is hard, and now you're asking me to believe in the devil and demons, like, I, like, I just can't go there. That's like Halloween ghost story stuff. So they kind of go like, I don't know what all that is about, but I don't really need to believe in it particularly strongly, you know, because I'll just work on believing in God. So that's an example of how people make faith lighter. Don't, you don't have to believe in this extraneous stuff. Just focus on the essentials. Yeah. But the, but the logic of, of that, for me, what happened was that faith, if you just, if, you, if you're trying to make your faith survive by believing less, and eventually faith gets lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter until you just feel like you're hanging on to this balloon and you're just going like, why am I holding on to this balloon? Like it's, it's been so evacuated of any content yeah. that, that you, it's, you don't notice that you don't need it anymore. Yeah. And I kind of played that journey out, that journey of deconstruction out to that kind of, kind of ending. And I felt like, and some people at that point exit the faith. They, they do just let it go. But some of us stop and, kind of, and, and go, well, all right, if I've reached this kind of cul-de-sac, this kind of dead end, how, how do I build myself back into a robust faith, a, a, a Christianity that I can really sink my teeth into? And how do you do that? Like, what, what's that journey back towards what's called reconstruction? You deconstruct and then you reconstruct. What does that look like? How does that journey happen? So a lot of the book is is about my kind of journey back, but also in the early years of my writing, a lot of people on this journey of deconstruction kind of came to me as one of these voices about um, that can help them both deconstruct and reconstruct. Yeah. And so that's kind of where I've gained some. You you talk about in the book, and I like I've heard you say this before, but I just think it's so clear. Um, that one God had become like an intellectual problem to be solved, Mm -hmm. not a, I don't know if you said relationship or, but you know, an encounter uh, with a living, you know, Supreme being. Uh, And then you, you talk about how one of the things that was fueling all that is where you were spending your attention when you're deconstructing, because you're reading other people and, you know, basically you're a, cancer patient who had cancer and you're taking the chemo even when you no longer have the cancer um yeah so i think that's what happens with a lot of people who go through journeys of deconstruction they start listening to deconstructing podcasts they start listening to reading reading deconstructing authors and your church might not know this but there's a whole genre of christian podcasting and blogging and writing and speaking circuits where people kind of fill in this gap. They're kind of saying, hey, you, you are being affected and hit hard by this secular age. You are struggling with doubt. Let, let me show you how you can read the Bible differently, how you can think about God or the atonement differently. There's a whole industry of people who will help you on the journey of deconstruction. And, and honestly, some of my early writing was in that genre. But I got convicted that what needed to be inserted into this, into this conversation was somebody who can kind of walk us back from that abyss. There, there are authors and podcasters that dime a dozen that can help you hold your faith less, you know, seriously, less, seriously. Like, like I didn't want to contribute another book to that conversation. I'd done enough of that work. I wanted to write a book to kind of help people believe again and again, but the path towards that belief wasn't to just say, believe people, just, just, and I think this is where pastors, and let me be clear, this is important, if, if, if your people are listening in and kind of going, how is this relevant to me? Well, it's relevant because the, the, the evangelistic field, a lot of your people, if you go around and say, you know where evangelism is occurring more and more often, not on the street, in our homes. We, we are trying to evangelize our children. We are not yeah. whole- we are not holding our own children to the faith. Yeah. And so if you don't think this is relevant, this is relevant for every parent. Mm-hmm. This is relevant for spouses because mm-hmm. spouses are falling away from the faith. So, so we are fighting a frontline battle to kind of give a, give a, right. a witness for the faith in very intimate spaces now. 
And so we can't just look at our kids or our spouses or our friends or family members or, or the people in our pews and just say, hey, everybody, just believe this because it's true. Right. I think this is where Andrew Root in the Dancing Gorilla Experiment comes, comes to our aid here because it shows us that what we need to do is not just say, you know, here, kids, you know, here's the Bible, believe it. Um, instead, we, how do we kind of nurture faith by directing their attention to God's movement in our lives? In mm-hmm. um, because then you're wooing uh, rather than just demanding faith where people can't produce it on the spot. Right. You know, you, you bringing it back to how is this relevant to PV people's life? That's exactly what I, I'm trying to do, what you just described. Because I, 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 there, I, I was telling you offline, I've got a Bible study on Sunday nights with about 15 nuns, N-O-N-E, people who don't go to church, don't believe in God, Jesus, you know, all that stuff. But they're interested. They wanted to have meaningful conversations. And um, I have used the material that we've talked about through the years and also in this book with them specifically. And and so everybody listen at home, I want you to think about the people, you know, and love in life who you went, you know, they walked away from church, but they've got the church camp t-shirt. You gave them their senior high school Bible. You have, you know, you've loved and cared about these people and now they're no longer there. That's who we're talking about. And you describe something so simple that's actually, I've struggled to put words on it for years. You describe it as the ache. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so in the book, I, I, I say one, often one of the first kind of moves back towards enchantment is kind of noticing um, the pain or the ache that is caught that is that has been left in the modern world because uh, god has died and by that by that god has died i mean that kind of frederick nietzsche the famous philosopher you know announced the end of christianity when he said god is dead you know our song 728b was written in response what was it yeah our god is alive because time magazine made nietzsche like the um man of the year back in like the 60s right and so Anyway, well, in the modern version of that is that song, that contemporary Christian music song. You know, God is God. You know, God is not Our God dead. God is not dead. Yeah, yeah. And so that those that music and that phrase, God is not dead, is speaking to the Nietzsche's cultural diagnosis that God is is dead. In my book, I don't say God is dead. I say God is slowly dying in the West. Mm-hmm. So it's God's slow withdrawal from the center of our uh, our sensibilities. And not that God is Tinkerbell and dependent on us to believe in him, but it, the, we're losing our awareness of this God. Right, right. God's still there like the dancing gorilla. God's still there. We, we, our attention is, has been shifted. Yeah. So God is still there. So one of the ways I say, one of the first ways to kind of get people to draw their attention back to this, that, the central existence of God is to draw attention to how... I guess the dissatisfactions of the modern secular age, right? The, the pain that is caused in a secular kind of godless existence. And so uh, I kind of hit upon this. I was in the book. I tell a story. I was talking to my, my dad, my dad's an elder, longtime elder of church of Christ of Pennsylvania. And, you know, he was noticing some of the demographic decline in the church that, you know, we're not holding our young people. The church is getting smaller. It's getting older and grayer. And he, and he just kind of made this sweeping statement. People just don't have a desire for God anymore. But I said, Dad, but if you look around amongst these younger generations, you see increasing rates of depression, um, anxiety, uh, addiction, loneliness, and suicide risks. Um, and I go, that, that, so when I name that, that's the ache. These, these. The, the anxieties and the pain of a secular age. And I said, that, that is how we speak about our desire for God. We've lost the ability to talk about God directly. And so instead we talk about our anxiety uh, or we talk about our depression or we talk about how life isn't worth living. Like, like God has died and now there's this big gaping hole 
and we're seeing all these symptoms around that hole where God has gone missing. And so one of the things I do with my students who are struggling with faith is before I just start saying, hey, believe in God, I, I'll start with like th these symptoms, right? Like, like clearly something is wrong. Clearly right. you're hurting. Clearly you are lost. Clearly you are anxious. Well, well why is that? Like, well, where is that coming from? Um, what, what, what used to be there? that would carry your, your self-esteem and your self-worth? What, what, what's going to carry your broken heart through this romantic trauma? Uh, what, what's, what's going to give your life meaning in the face of prolonged unemployment? Um, I mean, like, like what, where, what has gone missing? Right. Right. And, and so what you're doing by drawing attention to the ache is, is listening a, um, a thirst for God. Yeah. It, uh, it, it, the, the ache doesn't prove God's existence, but it definitely makes you kind of go like, I want to drink a water. Like it makes you, thirsty. right. It makes you thirsty for God. Like I, I, I do need something. And, and I want to be clear. And this is one of the, the, the issues that, that some people ask at this point, like we're, we're not believing in God for, for mental health benefits. This, this is sometimes what I can be mistaken as saying. So the idea here is like, you, you have all these, all this suffering and emotional pain. So if you believe in God, you'll be happier and healthier. Now, to, let me be clear. Psychologists have long known that. Psychologists have long documented that religious people um, tend to be among the happiest people in the world. Huh. Um, and so that's just a fact. But, wow. but, that's, but So I don't want to say that we go to young people and say, you need to believe in God to be happier because God then becomes kind of a part of your self-help you know, project. Um, and I try to wrestle with that some toward the back end of my book um, about how we don't want to reduce God to um, whatever just makes me happy. Right. But still, so I want to mention that point, but I want to come back to the central point that says is that we aren't fully flourishing uh, and resilient without God. And drawing attention to that is often a way you can kind of insert a conversation or begin drawing people's attention back towards God. Yeah. Hey, what has been missing from my life? What, what do I need that I'm not getting from Facebook and Netflix? Um, you know, right. Clearly these things aren't filling my void. So what's going on? So back in the day, we used to be able to do evangelism by helping people like feel guilty and then, okay, you're guilty. You're a sinner before God. You've hurt people. You've done bad things in your life. Now you can be forgiven and get grace, which is a really great thing. And a part of the story of the gospel. But <clears throat> if you were to go up to a nun, their experience of the absence of God in their life is probably not the presenting issue for them is probably not guilt. Sometimes it might be. But the presenting issue for most of our kids and grandkids and maybe in our own hearts is what you just described, the ache. Yeah, anxiety, right? Yeah, so you, so you begin not with, um, yeah, yeah, so a generation ago. So you think, you know, your church, a generation ago, and I was raised in this, you can kind of assume in, in a, in, when, during a time of a kind of a Christian consensus, even if they mm -hmm. weren't church going people, the, the, the culture was not had enough of a Christian consensus that you could begin a conversation by saying, are you right with God? Right. Are you going to go to heaven if you die? Yeah. Are you right with God? And, and that, that, that was a time and a place where people could, could admit to you over coffee. Probably not, you know, probably not. And so, so then you can then say, okay, then what, what it, will it take for you to get right with God? But nowadays, in a post-Christian context, um, when, when, the, when believing in God is hard, and in addition, believing in a judgmental God is almost impossible. Mm. So it's not just that the argue, argument from guilt um, is implausible, it's actually counterproductive. Mm. Because a lot of these young people, if you kind of lead with, hey, God, um, there is a God, and he's judging you. Mm -hmm. They'd be like, man, don't hit me with that stuff. Like, <laughs> really? Like, like, really? <laughs> yeah. It's going to do that old, you know, they'll do the old, the, yeah, really boomer kind of stuff on you. Like, really? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Really, so mom I, and grandpa, I, you guys going to guilt me into this? Like, like, it's just not a good move. But if you can go to the young person and say, are you anxious? They're going to be like, yes, they are a very anxious generation. 
And they're, they're going to raise their hand on that. And then you can say, well, why are you so anxious? What, what are you lacking that is giving you a firm ground of peace and joy and happiness? What is, so yeah, I'm suggesting we maybe move our evangelistic peel into that register. Then kind of the generation go, um, are you right with God? That, that move I think is kind of counterproductive for lots of people. 